Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I just wanted to take a moment and give a very sincere thank you to everyone who has supported the John Versations podcast. Whether it's watching the show on YouTube or streaming on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or following us on Instagram or liking the Facebook post or just sharing the show with your friends, just know that from the bottom of our hearts, you are very appreciated. Uh, and that is from myself and our post-production editor, Mr. Matt Halliday. We are just so thankful that there are people who tune in every week and really enjoy what we do. If you haven't followed us on Instagram, if you're a new listener, please head over to Instagram, Facebook. We're on both of those at at John Versations. Uh, on Twitter, we are uh, twitter.com forward slash a John Versation. Subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, just so you don't miss anything, right? We want to make sure we're getting the show out to as many people as we can and hopefully continue to keep putting out the best content that we can for you guys. So again, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much. And let's get into this week's episode. John Versations podcast number 28. My guest today is an actor, writer, and producer living in Los Angeles, California. His new film, Two Ways to Go West, is available to watch on video on demand now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. James Liddell. James, thank you so much for being here, man. I, I'm so happy that, to have you on the show. Yo, yeah, dude. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. That's Glad not a problem. Up. Yeah, I mean, you know, before we kind of jump into the movie and stuff like that, I mean, I've known you since I was essentially like a kid. I mean, we used to deliver pizzas at the same yeah. place and yeah. you grew up with my younger brother. So it's like, you've always kind of long, been around. Long and, time. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've had some other people from some other, you know, people that are in Michigan or have been Michigan transplants. And I got to tell you, man, one of my favorite things to do is to like have people on that I, I knew that I grew up with. And then you've gone on to do these amazing things and two ways to go West is really one of those, man. I, I watched the movie last night and the whole time Thanks, I was dude. like, God damn, this is good. So. <laughs> and it, it's, it's such a trip and, and no one, you know, we're going to catch up. I don't know what it was. I, uh, I went down a rabbit hole last night of, of finally getting on Facebook and seeing what everybody from my past has been up to. It was very bizarre but it's so cool to see what everybody goes on to do. Yeah, man. I just, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I know you were always the man at like, if I, if the band had a show or something, I was always like, Hey, <laughs> James, you feel like you feel like covering for me. And you were always like, <laughs> fuck yeah, man, I'm about that money. So, <laughs> Make a few bucks. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, man, but it's, it's, I don't know. It just feels like it's, it was so long ago. And then to, watch the movie last night and cause even back then, you know, that's what you wanted to do. And I think, yeah. Well, your brother was in the first short film I ever directed. I'm sorry. It probably tanked the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> he was the worst part about it, but there was plenty of other bad things about it. So right. it's all good. I forgive I, you, Jake. You know what? He's my brother, and I don't even know if he listens. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Say what you want. But fuck him. Yeah. No, it's just. Uh, I don't know, man. There's. It's just something so cool about seeing somebody who's been passionate about something for so long. And, and has been saying like, I'm going to do this. And then years later to, you know, cause I know you've been doing plays and like, I, like you've had, yeah. you had a role in killer kids, didn't you? If I remember correctly. <laughs> that's yeah. That's my big claim to fame so far. Yeah. Right. I, as soon as I moved out here, it was one of the first things I booked uh, when I got an agent and you know, at the time it was like, this is so cool you're on set and there's fake snow in the middle of the desert. And it's like, I'm here, I made it. And then you watch it and you go, Oh man, what did I do? So who did you play in killer kids? Okay. So uh, we're doing the killer kids bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just, dude, it's we, just uh, I, I think it's, well, the reason I want to talk about it is because I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. If, if there's people who no, are listening is. who are like, I, that's, you know, I think it's good that people know like, Hey, you got to start. I, I mean, that's I just, fucking TV. I just, that shit's I, on I Netflix. I get a laugh out of it because, you know, I, I came out here, I was, I think I was 24 when I booked that. And, uh, I was way too big for my, 
my face <laughs> and my head. So I had like the body, like the, you know, a bodybuilder would have. And I'm trying to play, uh, I think I was supposed to be 16 or 17 in the show. I had a baby face. I looked it. So the director booked me off a tape. And, you know, when I got out here, I would audition for these Nickelodeon shows or Disney or whatever it may be. And I would disguise my body. I would wear like a baggie or, you know, whatever it, it was. And he booked me off a tape and we get on set and he's like, all right, well, we want to see you in a, a tank, James. He's like, oh, no. Because <laughs> these other kids are playing 16, 17. You're like, yeah, that's you're a real 16 year old. Yeah, you're like a butt. And 10. I'm like, now I'm like 19 inch arms. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, fuck you, dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was fine because they put like an AK in my hand. And in, in the you know, thing about this is it's it's true stories. So it's basically like a reenactment show. Uh, so I played a real killer kid who killed this a buddy of his, his grandparents. And so they put an AK in my hand and I'm like the, the body guard of this little group that they have together. And, and I killed his grandparents. Well, and it doesn't sound like you have any remorse for it either. So. No, fuck them. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that was horrible. Cause they, <laughs> But, yeah, but it, it was the first time that I, I could be like, hey, mom and dad, you can actually see me on TV like or, or, or whatever. You look it up online. Like it was a thing that happened. It's real. I did it. And you can watch it. And that was pretty cool to, to come home for Christmas. And my dad's just got it on, on loop on the TV after my first year in L.A. He's like, I DVR'd it. And he was talking shit. He's like, well, you look like you're going to piss your pants. I'm like, I don't know how to act. Right. This is, this I'm is not brand good. new. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, I don't know, man. It's, there's something, again, it's just kind of crazy that, like, you know, I think people think, and, and again, this is something I really liked about the movie, too, and, and we'll get into that. But, you know, mm -hmm. I think people think it's like, I'm going to go to L.A. and I'm going to be an actor. And they don't think that it's like, are you going to book a commercial or you're going to book killer kids or you're going to do like stage plays? Cause I know you've done some plays and stuff too, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, just this past year, I think October, we did a run of a beautiful play called uh, on an average day. We we're thinking about doing it. We were invited to do it at a the fringe festival here in LA and, and that got shut down because of, you know, COVID and all that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love, being on stage it's it's always a really really fulfilling experience probably more so than anything else i've ever done as far as an actor well let me ask you this because you know and again i i, I promise you we're gonna get to the movie because i have so many cool like, questions hey man and the last thing i <laughs> want to talk about on a day-to-day -day basis is the movie so let's so, talk so, about you oh man <laughs> i just you know got a kid just living well, outside Nashville. Dude, dude, listen all the same things you said uh about me we we linked up and I was like, oh, you, you live in Nashville. You're married. You got a kid. Great, man. Yeah, yeah. How long you been in Nashville? How old uh, is the kid? Catch me uh, up. I've been here now. I've been here. It's crazy to think, but I've been here now uh, almost seven years, wow. which is pretty See, nuts. You split right after I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very. I think it was uh, like two thousand. Two, it was like two thousand twelve. So like the end of two thousand twelve. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, I'm eight years in. Yeah. Um, or no, I'm sorry. Probably the end of, yeah. End of 2013. It was September. It was right before Halloween. Wow. So yeah. And then, you know, I met my wife and she was from here oh, and cool. we were doing the long distance thing. And eventually I was just like, well, let's see what I can fit in my car and just, hell yeah, know, dude. That's I awesome. Was just working in the factory in Michigan and you know, the band had kind of slowed down. So I was like, well, fuck it. So, fuck it. so I came down here and you know, we've been together for, and the kid is, uh, uh, kid is almost two so it's like wow. it's yeah it's congratulations been, uh, man that's awesome well i tell everybody congratulate me when she's 18 she's not a piece yeah. of shit that's like <laughs> that's my she's great now but i want to make sure that she like becomes a decent human being yeah so that's it's a hell of an objective <laughs> for sure well you know one thing i wanted to ask you and i was thinking about this because i had a uh, um a com uh, comedian on the show who is from LA as well. Her name is Chase O'Donnell and she's done, you know, she does acting and stand up, but she was saying that she really enjoys, um, she really enjoys, she performs at UCB because she gets to be, oh, cool. she gets to be a character and there's something, yeah. she, it, you know, to her, there's something a little bit more freeing about like, 
oh, I can say things that I would never say as a real, you know, as my real person or kind of, you know, throw myself out there. So I was wondering, like, is it the same kind of thing for you? Because, I mean, that's what you're doing as an actor. You're you you get a role and then you're like, okay, I've got to figure out a way to become this person. Yeah. And what's oh, sorry. Go ahead, but. Yeah, I did. Uh, UCB is great. I did some classes at UCB. I never performed there um, in a show or anything, but I, I respect improv so much. And it's such a valuable tool to have as an actor or a comedian. But yeah, I, I think the most fun I ever have with anything in acting is just playing silly characters. And there's so much freedom in it because if you're doing something that's supposed to be at an 11, how do you fuck that up? You know, the only thing you can do is be too small. And, you know, it's easy for me to say this because, and you you know me, the first post you posted when I put the movie out there, you said, that's more than I've heard you talk in five years of <laughs> yes. working with you. Yeah. So when I act, I I naturally come in low. So if, if anything's con- anything is bigger than me, I go to 11 and I'll usually land around an eight. But it's so much fun trying to get there. Yeah, and I like that's one thing I told my wife too when I watched the movie. I was like, I'm so excited to watch this because you are always that person. And it honestly, it's one of the things that I, I admire about you and I admire about people like you is that there are certain people out there that they don't say a lot. They're very quiet and and reserved. But when they do speak, everybody listens. And then you've got people like me who just don't shut the fuck up. So <laughs> you know you definitely gotta find a balance. You know, grass is always greener. But um it's so much easier for me in a one-on-one conversation like this or I'm on a set and I'm a character or I have lines and I know exactly what to say because you don't like being a shy or introverted person. You don't have to worry about that judgment. It's probably, you know, if we're going to get a little psychological with it, probably what initially drawed me, pulled me towards acting was that, that, that want or desire to put myself out there. But it's easier to do it if you're pretending to be someone else, you know? Yeah. Now, is it like, is it fun for you? Because in the movie you have some, like I was watching it and I was like, okay, you're, you're genuinely baseline to a point and then everything kind of turns on its head. So is it fun for you to not really being that person? Cause like, I, I don't think in all the years I've known you, I've seen you frustrated, but I've never seen you like, angry you know what i mean like you're yeah. like i said you're always a very you've always been a very baseline human being in my experiences with you so is it fun for you to like be able to kind of take the break off and just be like sometimes there was- and it, it depends what it is and in the moment you know whether it's fun or freeing or, or or therapeutic i think it's always beneficial but definitely definitely gotta be careful about walking that line too closely and i've had directors kind of have to pull me back of you're going in a little too method with this because you know, if you're, you know, that's, and it is what it is, the the quality or the quality or the, the talent of the acting, you know, whatever, but that's me actually angry in that movie. Like you're, whether you, you could connect to the material so well that you can say those words and actually be angry when you're saying them, or if you don't, and you have to, you know, find some imaginary substitution that, okay, now I'm fucking pissed off and I'm pretending I'm saying this to you. I mean, you're actually angry. You're going to trick your brain into feeling the way you, you believe you're experiencing the world. And that's, you know, kind of where you got to get really good and quick at, okay, we're wrapped. That's it. I'm, I'm done with that emotion. And it can be really hard to do especially with the play that we just talked about on an average day, it isn't exactly the most upbeat or fun material. It deals with some really, really heavy themes and you're doing the thing for, you know, rehearsals we did for three, four months. And then you, you put it up three, four times a week and you have to actually get there every night or you hope to, uh, and you know, there's ways to, to fake it or, or, sneak by the audience a few times here and there but that's not the objective so it's like on the best the best nights of the 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 show are the nights where afterwards i'm a mess i miserable 
hate myself. <laughs> I can't stop crying. And everyone's like, oh, let's go have a beer and celebrate. I'm like, okay, I, I guess. I feel like I, I got in a car accident, but all right. So it's, it's, it's a weird thing, but it's, it's definitely fulfilling and fun when the material's fun. Well, and, and I think that's a really good point too, because, you know, there's like the whole, there's the whole, I mean, I don't know it, w- how much truth there is to it, but there's the whole thing with Anthony Hopkins, whenever he would do a like Hannibal Lecter, like a uh, silence of the lambs or something like whenever he got into that character for like three weeks, he'd have to go to a cabin. Cause like his wife was like, you can't come home. Cause you're not, <laughs> it's such a oh, dark my, place to go. Yeah, my girlfriend, like, like she knows like, it's gonna, we're not gonna, <laughs> things aren't gonna be great for a month. And it's like, we joke about it, but yeah, I'm not the, it's not fun to be around me when four hours before the show, I got to start, you know, this doesn't go with every role or every actor, you know, whatever. At the same time, it's like a fucking bullshit actor stuff, but it's like four hours before the thing, I'm, I'm starting to go down that, that mental train of all the reasons that I hate myself and need to feel the way about myself that the character does. No one wants to be around me. It's you sound very pleasant. Like, <laughs> to be a guy, let's grab a beer, man. So, yeah, yeah. Go but, home. <laughs> but you know, I think that really speaks to because I really do think, and and you know, I'm I'm someone I've just always enjoyed movies. It, like I watch anything because I I really like good narrative, which I think Two Ways to Go West did a, a really good job with carrying the story through. It didn't really lull things like that, but you know making that connection <clears throat> and I, I've you know I feel like if you are someone who can who can do that if you're someone who can you know maybe you're not mad that you know someone slept with your girlfriend but you're like you said like I can bring up this feeling from you know I was mad about this and then how do I you know I got in that car accident that that dude hit me and I was so pissed and how do I yeah. bring that out you know um yeah. and I feel like that's I really do feel like that's what makes something feel honest and authentic you know what I mean? As opposed yeah. to just being like, Oh, you're just doing this emotion. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and you know, I, there's always the other side of it. And I have an acting teacher that would always say, I don't care what you felt up there. I care what the audience felt. And that's true too, completely, but also a good indication of if they felt something is, did I feel it? For sure. Well, yeah, man, I, I, uh, I don't know. It's the, the emotion in the film really really came came off very very strong um and 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 from your character from your character from gavin specifically um so you know i one thing i did want to ask you is you know i was watching the movie and i could tell that some of it was you know a big part of it and and i I won't give anything away i don't want to ruin anything anything like that but you know it's it's about a uh a Detroit transplant who moves to LA to be an actor, very on the nose. And then, <clears throat> you know, uh, you were uh, a television star in the film and then had some substance abuse issues uh, and have gone through recovery. And now you're on the the other end of that. So, you know, I wanted yeah. to ask, cause you know, knowing you, it's, you wrote the film, which I, yeah. you know, one thing I want to, you wrote the film, you star in the film, you produce the film. So when you were writing it, you know, I know that moving to moving from, you know, Detroit to LA and, and, you know, going on that actor's journey was definitely something, but where did the rest of that idea come from? Cause you know, yeah. I, you know, I don't know, is it, I mean, not well, to get too it, personal with you, but yeah, no, I, I'm happy to, I mean, you saw the movie, I'm not bashful about, you know, kind of opening up. So don't be afraid uh, to hurt my feelings or anything, but um you know, it, it didn't start personal at all. It started as, all right, I got a couple of buddies. We were actors. The phone's not ringing as much as we wanted to. Why don't we do our own thing? And I had an opportunity to pitch a director who wanted to do a feature and had some access to some financing. So I pitched him this concept. I just had to keep it simple. You know, doing a, a no budget movie or low budget, you know, it, it costs so much money to make a movie. It's unreal, but it doesn't always have to. And again, that shows on the screen, but I knew, okay, if we could do this for 25 grand, we could make it look like 250 grand. And again, you watch 250 grand movie 
it ain't very good. You're not going to be watching it in a movie theater for the most part. You know, obviously right. there's the, the, you know, the anomalies, the paranormal activity, whatever the example may be. Blair Witch Project. They happen. Like, yeah. yeah. And there's always a little bit of a shtick to it. But, you know, great films can be made for nothing. And we made this thing for next to nothing. And so we had to do it. I figured, what can we do with one location? Okay, obviously, we'll, we'll try and expand the scope, you know, use whatever we can do to make it feel bigger than that. What can we do with one location, minimal actors, because it's the only way we're, we're going to get this done in the 10 days that we have in the budget that we have to pay what we are required to pay by SAG and X, Y, and Z and all the other bullshit. And I thought, well, I'm going to write it as though it's a stage play and we're going to shoot it. We're going to do long takes and it's going to be an actor's movie we're going to give the actors a chance to do what they love because on so many movies and i mean you know everybody had probably has an idea of this but it's like you get a couple lines out and it's a cut and we're moving angles and we're doing it and then you do so you spend so much time not actually acting that i don't know you you don't really feel the satisfaction that you would on the stage where you're doing an entire play with an intermission so we would do some of these scenes are nine, 10 minutes. Yeah, it's not for a broad audience. A lot of people typically, you know, don't like a dialogue scene that long. But if you resonate with the material and you connect with it, then there is a, a, a market for it. And there's people that will resonate with it. So I think that, that the script really needed to speak to somebody and speak about something. And when I write, it always comes from a thematic place. So it's like, okay, now we've got one location. We've got a few actors. What could be happening? Okay, bachelor party. And then fill in the blanks. And then, okay, now what is this movie actually about? Okay, what do we actually want to talk about? As far as my point of view on the world as a writer. And, and then, you know, it just kind of develops from there. And as far as, you know, it feels so personal, it, you know, it's, it's magnification. You take something that you feel or a wound you have or, or something that has bothered you your whole life, whatever, whoever dumped you in high school, whatever it may be, and you expand that feeling out. And the circumstances may not be the same, but you're writing from that feeling. And if you can express that on the page, well, then I hope that someone will read it and go, oh, Jesus Christ, man, did you, were you, is this? And, you know, one of the few indications that I got right off the beginning when I finished the first draft of the script, you know, I had a lot of people read it, read it, and, you know, I raised the, the financing myself. So I was reaching out to potential investors and this and that. And we had really, really strong response. And it was like, but did you, I didn't know you. And it was like this weird thing of like, it's all good. Well, whatever you want to ask me, ask me. But it's like there's real emotion in there, even if not the circumstances aren't exactly real. Yeah, because I was like, I don't remember, I don't remember James snorting pills, you know what I mean? So I was like, you know, I like, you know, I, yeah, I, I I remember seeing him drinking a little too much every once in a while, like every once in a while. There was a couple that's, rough mornings making dough at the well, pizza place, but. That's why old Jimmy don't drink no more. That's why I had to switch to pills. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I think that's a, it's it's crazy that you say that because when I watched the film, that was very much the vibe that I got was, oh, this is set up exactly like this is set up exactly like a play and it's broken into yeah. those acts. Um, especially with the title cards kind of moving the and again, I won't kind of I won't I don't want to jump in yeah. and give any spoilers because I really want people to to watch the movie. I, I got it on Amazon Prime last night, but um it it is it's a very it's a very intimate film. And I don't mean like as far as because there's some movies that you see and you're like, yeah, I mean, obviously there wasn't the budget for it. So they have, you know, two low. I think of, like, of something like the disaster uh, or what's the uh, not the disaster artist, but like the room, uh, the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like the rooftop in the apartment. You know what I mean? There's yeah. like, you know, but then there's there's films that feel small, but it's intentional. And the other thing right. that really stuck out to me is, like you said, is very dialogue heavy. And what it, what it honestly reminded me of when I was watching it, and I don't know if you would agree with this or, you know, maybe, again, this is somebody completely from outside yeah. of that world, but it reminded me a lot of almost the Kevin Smith format 
without like the over the top like smoochy because if you go back and yeah. watch those movies it's all yeah very I'm dialogue huge, huge based kevin kevin smith fan and, and you're right and i think it comes comes more from like the same obstacles it comes from this is what we have we don't have much money so how can we make that work as opposed to facing a blank page of i can write anything open interior you know exterior outer space spaceship it's like okay we, we have a room okay can we get a hotel room can we make a room look like a hotel room and then and i like that i like having some uh, a problem to solve to start with as opposed to just all right what are we going to do and and i think those those limitations just induce creativity well and i think too that it's i think that you are having with this film particularly and again even with like the like the kind of the kevin smith films is that i think you're doing what a lot of filmmakers don't do um you know like yeah man a, a fucking michael bay movie is going to be explosions and and yeah. you know chicks with their boobs half out and all this stuff and it, it's you know it's it's fun to watch but are you are you trusting in your audience do do you think that your audience is intelligent and that's one thing i really got from your film it's like if if you're watching this and you like yeah. this is because we're trusting you to yeah to, i always, I always say it. i always say you know right to the smartest person in the room you know you i uh, i don't and again you know it's it's taste but i think if you if you dumb it down for you know the slowest person to get the joke or whatever it may be well then it's the, the dialogue is going to be on the nose it, it's going to feel so surface level now of course at, at a certain point you still need people to understand where you're going with it and, and people say oh this is exposition this is uh, no exposition well, also, you still have to tell the story. It's like you don't have your characters say the story, but they can't also not, you, you still have to move the story forward. So I, I always kind of fell a little too far into that camp of right to the, the smartest person in the room and fuck everybody else. And now I'm like, okay, maybe <laughs> this beat's a little too subtle. Maybe this information needs to be fleshed out a little further. Because if the audience doesn't pick up on it or doesn't connect the pieces that you think that they're going to pick up on, well, then y you've lost them. So I definitely think there's a balance in, in it, it. You know, it, it's what's the material? What are we trying to say? Are we talking about a really, really complex ethical point of view on the world? Well, then, yeah, there's going to be a lot of subtext and it's going to be hard to follow that thread. Or are we talking about, you know, good versus evil and robots? Right. Or, you know, like a Pepsi machine or like product placement coming to life. And yeah, you know yeah. I mean, like, I don't know, man, it's just, it's, I, I'm, I'm also a big fan of independent movies. I like small movies that, that number one, have the potential to, to grow out of that, that small film, you know, like there's so many movies and I'm kind of like a comedy nerd, but you think of something like Tucker and Dale versus evil. It's just like, you yeah. know, they've filmed it in the woods and it becomes this like cult thing. Yeah. Where everybody's like, that movie's fucking awesome. And I, I see that, I see your film having that same potential where as the audience oh, kind of grows, I think it's something that people are, it's, I think it's a really good example of like a character study that's done really, really well. Um, Thank you. I appreciate uh, nope. that. Yeah, I didn't do shit. You made and, it. Thank and I you. always, <laughs> and I always, you know, it's 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 not a movie that's for everybody. But I think that people who have have stakes or care about what it's discussing, I think that they very quickly and easily forgive uh, the budget and and whatever shortfalls it, it may have because, you know, I I, I tend to be a little too hard on myself and bash any and everything I do and whatever. But every time I watch a clip or, or reread the script, whatever it may be, I'm like, you know what, despite everything, there's something honest in this. And I think that that's enough for me. You know, there's something tapped into something truthful that I actually felt. And I think that's all I can try and do moving forward. Yeah. And I think that's part of the creator's brain too. Cause I mean, I can tell you, man, I have a hard drive full of songs that I've recorded here that like, yeah, just haven't gone anywhere. Cause every time I listen to them, I'm like, 
oh, I could do this better. And then when I do yeah. put something out, it's like, oh man, I wish I would have done this. Like if I would have done it just as like, what would, what would it be like if I would have just tweaked this a little bit? I think if you're someone who is, is putting, even with this podcast, man, I go back to this podcast and I go, I sound like a fucking idiot when I ask that question. Like I wish, <laughs> you know, I, my but wife. It's so important. Out, it's so important to be willing to do that because it, and I, I struggle with it so much and it's a balancing act that I, that I go through every time I try and write because it's like I, you start out with, I'm just going to write something to make a movie. I'm just going to write something. It's going to suck. I'm going to write something horrible, but I'm going to finish it. And then it becomes, ooh, well, that's kind of cool. Oh, 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 oh. And now it's like, you, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. And then once you run into problems or obstacles, you're like, oh, fuck, uh, this isn't good. Now I'm going to stop because I have the expectation of a masterpiece and I can't fulfill. So it's a constant reminder of like, you're not going to control the quality of, of what you do based on, on will. You're going to control how hard you work on it. And wherever you're at in, in your craft, that's, that will determine how good it is. And I have to remind myself of that a lot. Yeah, and I think it also comes down to, and, and you know, again, I mean, just from my experience playing music and bands and, and stuff yeah. like that, but like you're never going to be, whether it's a film or, you know, a podcast or a, or a, a song or a band or you're never, there's never anything out there. <laughs> I mean, fuck man, people hate the Beatles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, right? like yeah. you're, you're never going to put something out where everybody was like, Hey, great job. I really, there's always going to be, yeah. There's always going to be a group of people that you will that will cause hey man, you to second if, guess yourself. You know, if if you don't have people talking shit about you, the right people, then you're probably not doing it right. You know, and that's a you know, cheesy cliche line, but I, I feel like it's so true. If everybody, oh yeah, you're great, you're cool, cool, cool. I don't know how authentic that is, but if some people, you know, I really, really felt what you were saying there, and other people are like, fuck you. Well, uh, there's probably some truth in it. Oh man, I am. Uh, I'm waiting for the day that this podcast gets big enough that I can go through like the comments and get upset. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm like. I, <laughs> all right, I'm doing something right. People hate yeah. me. Yeah. So, but well, you know, I did want to die. What? What, uh, oh, go ahead. what inspired you to to get started on this thing, man? So I'll be honest. Like you know, I mean, you know me. Growing up, I was always in a band. Like always. Yeah. Um, and playing in bands i met a lot of interesting people and and you know one of my favorite things was just always like even with the guys that i was in the band with is like when we weren't playing music we were just sitting around and, and talking and mm -hmm. you know so i moved in i moved outside just i'm like 15 minutes outside the city so i moved oh that's awesome like the nashville area and you know i was just like man i miss i like i miss having converse like those kind of conversations i miss putting stuff out and because that's the thing like you know we were always putting out you know records or playing shows or, or there was something that we could do to kind of put something creative out into the world and i just i wasn't doing it like i've yeah. you know, been used to and so i was like fuck it man i'm just gonna you know start a podcast and and my whole goal was I wanted to bring people on with interesting life stories and perspectives. Yeah. And, and I mean, you fall into that category. Like, you know, you've followed, you know, followed a dream. You're at the point now where you've made that dream into a reality. And now you've got this whole like open door of prospects for things that come yeah. in the future. And so I don't know, man, it was, I think it was really just, I bought everything to do it. And then my daughter was born. And I was like, oh, well, because I was like, I'm just doing it from home. Like, I'll be able to do yeah. it, you know, and that didn't happen. Uh, and then I started off by having people here and we were doing inter interviews in person and then COVID hit. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's it. Like, I'm not going to be able to do it. And I had to adapt. And now doing it virtually has kind of given me the ability to have people on that. Like, I never like last week. Yeah, it we almost just had, expands. Yeah, we had Corey Chalmers, who is a uh, Emmy Award winning host. He's on. Uh, he's been on the show Hoarders. He is uh, one of the hosts and experts. But the show oh, wow. was, yeah, it was created because they followed him around to see what he did for a living. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, you know, so like, but I never would have been like, hey man, I'll fly out to Nashville. Like, let me buy you a right, plane right. ticket, and you know, so it's, yeah. I don't know, man. It's you know, it's That's just great, and, and it's, I'm sure it's like that thing of uh, if you. If you enjoy doing something, then, the, and it's so hard to, to 
live by this. But if you enjoy doing something, then you know you've you've won already. It doesn't matter if anybody ever sees the movie or the the listens the part. Doesn't matter because you're doing something that you like to do and love to do. And and I think for me, that's got to be fulfilling enough. And if it it and it always will to some extent be about the result or become about the result. But if you can constantly kind of put that in check and go, oh yeah, I'm doing what I love. I'm doing what I like to do. And at that, I've won already. No, I mean, and I'm, I'm right there with you, man. It's uh, you know, I've got a normal job. Like I work, I work a normal day job and stuff like that. But like, this is my, this is kind of my, like my, my passion. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you know, it's, absolutely. It's a, and let me ask you this, because I know for me, one thing that that I've really enjoyed is like, I, you know, a lot of people start podcasts and they're, you know, people in your position, they're actors or they have some kind of following. Like, you know, I, I was just a guy that was like, I just want to, you know, get on. And we've been yeah. in the, you know, I was on the radio in Metro Detroit, but outside of that, people are like, I don't know who this dude is. So I just got on and started talking and bringing people on. And I've kind of got to see the audience grow. Have you had a similar feeling with the film? I mean, you know, you put it out there and then like, have you been excited to see like the, the number of people who've embraced it? Does it feel like, you know, you're like, I guess when you work on something that large, like what is that feeling like when someone's like, dude, I, I like this. Yeah. It's, it was weird for me just because, you know, we actually shot the movie quite a while back and, you know, it without a full, team you know i'm doing so much of the heavy lifting i had a really great director on board who helped with so much and the movie wouldn't have probably ever happened without him but without you know i'm editing the thing i'm i'm pushing the sound edit through i'm doing things that it's like all right well let me figure out this let me figure out that let me and you're gonna run into obstacles okay let me figure out the music rights let me and then you get to distribution. Let me figure out distribution. Okay, now there's a hold up in distribution. And it's like, oh, your movie's coming out this month. And I'm like, really? Do I have to start thinking about that again? <laughs> it's like I've already overcome that traumatic period of my life. But then you get over yourself and you just try and enjoy it. And it's been really, it has been fun to see people writing reviews for sites that I follow, writing reviews, podcasts that I follow doing reviews and hearing what people think about it and, and getting a few really unbelievable reviews that I'm like, really? No. Who, <laughs> how much did you guys pay to get this review? Right. Like, no. I, I didn't pay But then money. also getting a really horrible review that like attacks you on a personal level. And it's, you just got to go for the ride and, and you got to be able to laugh at yourself and go, yeah, he's kind of right on that. <laughs> but it's, it's, I'm just glad some people have got what I was trying to say. And a handful of people, I, I feel like in the reviews really express that. That's awesome, man. And, and like I said, it's not like a, uh, it's not your typical. So for people who are, are listening it, cause you know, we're about, what well, we started right about seven thirty central. We're at like eight fifteen now. So people are probably like, "What the fuck is this movie right. about?" So <laughs> I was so, like that when you're t- hearing that pod, and you're like, "What the fuck are they talking about?" You're trying to piece it together. So I'll I'll give my synopsis and definitely let me know if you would change anything. But you know, Deal. when when I was watching it, was a group of friends uh, come together for a bachelor party. Um, again, we've kind of discussed your character. Like you moved out to LA, you became an actor, got a TV show, you know, struggled with addiction. You got clean. Now, you know, this is the first time you guys have all been together in a really long time. Um, and it's really about kind of hashing out some of those, some of those demons that, you know, kind of kept you guys apart or, you know, caused that rift in the communication for as as long as it did. Does that, I mean, does that sound fair? Am I missing anything? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's about those lifelong friendships that, you know, those buddies that you don't see them for 10 years and then it's like nothing changed. And it's like, you know, it's easy to say that when you're 20, like, oh, this is that kind of friend. And then you're 25 and it's like, yep, still there. And then it's like, oh, I haven't seen him in a few years. Is it, is it still going to be? And now we're like, okay, this is, 10 years later, what's going to happen? And it's like, oh no, has that changed? Are we all so different that we lost that, that one thing we thought we would always have? And it feels like they have. 
until they can get it back. And I feel like a big part of the story is the the journey of regaining uh, that friendship, that closeness and trust. Well, speaking of like, childhood friends because the movie opens up and it's it's beautiful like the like the overhead shot of the desert it's absolutely beautiful and then the credits are rolling and executive producers show up and i see joe harris (laughs) and like these are and these are people that i know that you've been so for my first thought was like oh man like if i would have known these assholes were getting money i wouldn't i wouldn't have paid for this (laughs) (laughs) i know right (laughs) no but that's an ongoing bit with joe he's like i hope i wish you all the best I hope uh, I hope it gets great reviews. I hope you don't make a fucking dime on it because I don't want these assholes <laughs> getting any of their money back. <laughs> well, it's like I, I was telling my wife, I was like, okay, so this movie is about, you know, a group of best friends who some have done like some sh- some shitty things to each other and it's about like whether we are are still able to be friends or not. So I was just like, I wonder what that conversation was like where – you go to your, your yeah. childhood friends. You're like, hey, I wrote this movie about like how yeah. shitty your childhood friends could be. You guys want to help well, out? Well, it's funny because it, it kind of actually started with Joe. And, uh, you know, I had this this potential producer on board and, and uh, you know, he wanted to change this, change that, change this. And, and you know, I, I let Joe read the script just for the hell of it. And uh, he was like, dude, this is, you got to make this thing. And he was like, are you thinking about doing it on your own? He, he said, I'd, I'd throw some money into this. And then, you know, a few people in LA said the same, a few network or, or industry connections. Said, and it was like, actually, well, I could just do this myself and make the movie that I want to make. So I'm really, really grateful to, to all those guys that, uh, I mean, really made the thing happen. Well, and it's, I got to tell you, man, too, from knowing, I mean, you know, there, Dan was on the, like, you know, just knowing all these people, yeah. I was just like, as cheesy as it sounds, like it made my heart full, you know, oh, I know, that's I guess, so cool. but like, I know what kind of guy Joe is. I know what kind of guy. An Eddie asshole. Is I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. No, but Big uh, piece of shit guys. <laughs> no, but like they, you know, and is, but that's the thing too, as much as you guys like rip on each other and might like, you know, like shit talk each other. Like at the end of the day, it's like, Hey dude, I, I see potential in what you're doing. I'd like, yeah. I want to be there to back you and help you with this. So it's, it's great. It's, it was just awesome to see that like those were the people that were yeah. behind and, you, know, those, you to push Those are dream. the guys that, that I've been to Vegas with and, and the best memories and in in times that we've had is when we're just bored in the hotel room talking shit to each other. And it's like, that's what we go back for just to, to catch up. Yeah. And I, I actually, I saw, I watched an interview with you and uh, Ryan Locker who directed the film and that really stuck out to me too. It's like, you know, you don't ever remember the times where you're like, Oh, you remember when you had that hot hand at the poker table? It was like, yeah, hey, yeah, remember yeah. when we're at the fucking IHOP at three in the morning yeah, and if we exactly. lost everything, you know? Yeah. Like you said, it, it, you know, those conversations that you have just sitting at, you know, Denny's or, or Zach's, Right, Zach's uh, Plymouth, uh, shout till, out. Till three in the morning. <laughs> Probably haven't been there in 15 years. Oh my God. I remember that being the spot. And, and we, you know, when we were younger, it was always like we'd go do the, whatever it was, if it was a, a soccer game we were all in a league on, or I didn't give a shit about the softball, the, eight, right. the high velocity softball league. No, we would bullshit in the parking lot after for three hours and, and see who bailed first. Right. Yeah, man. And, and, I think that's like really like, like watching the film, I think it really captured a lot of that where it's like, you know, cause I've got, friends, I mean, shout out to Taylor Smith, you know, his, and his band bear yeah. Prince just put out their first record. Fucking awesome. If you're listening, check that out. But you know, he's that friend for me where it's like, I could not see him, you know, for 10, 15 years. And I, I see it. It's like, Oh dude, like I would, it feels like I just hung out with you yesterday. Yeah. Even though, you know, in the, the course of our friendship, we've had like several ups and downs and arguments and, but it's like, it, it doesn't hold the same way. And I think yeah. the characters in the film, obviously there's a, there's, I think the stakes are a little bit higher, you know, like, cause this is like your first, kind of foray into the into like vegas and being clean and stuff like, like yeah. I, said, I don't want to give too much away but it's yeah. the the stakes are a little bit higher there but at the end of i think at the end of the day it's still about like don't forget where you came from 
you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a line from the movie. Right. <laughs> I told you I watched it, man. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I did want to kind of talk to you about. So I wanted to go through some of the casting with you because there are yeah. some, there's some fucking heavy hitters in this movie, man. Like we, we did good with the casting. Yeah. Like uh, Levy Tran is in it. Who's in, I mean, she was in shameless, yeah. uh, the haunting of Hill house. She's been on MacGyver. Yeah, uh, Levy's really, uh, Levy uh, has, has, she's blown up since she's, she's a huge star. She's dude. It was oh, cause you guys filmed this before. Like, I mean, she, she had some steam and she, she had a, a following and it was like, I just lucked out and, and was like, I know this girl's going to be, this girl's going to make it. And she was kind enough to, to be part of our little movie. And she was great. She, she was nothing but supportive. She wanted to help with crafty when she, she wasn't working. And it was just so good to see that, you know, commitment to indie films when you're kind of in a place where you don't necessarily have to. Yeah. And she's, I mean, she's awesome in it. Like uh, there's again, man, it's, it's, it's because I want people to see it. It's hard for me not to be like, dude, I really enjoyed this scene yeah, well, <laughs> and like, <tease> it. <laughs> and like the symbolism in it. <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, when, when there's that scene where you guys are laying in bed together, I'll just say that. And yeah. she's just, she's so, she's so like, genuine and believable in that scene but there's also there's also a little bit of like a like a vulnerability behind it where it's like if i with the story that she's talking about where it's like if things if yeah. i was doing that maybe i wouldn't be in the situation that i'm in now yeah you know absolutely and and it's like uh yeah i'm so glad you you're talking about uh, you know the symbolism of that scene because it's like i always think you know, the entire movie kind of tells the story. It foreshadows the entire story in the first five minutes. And I think that's most great movies. You just don't know it until you go back and watch it again. And, and a character will just blatantly say the theme of the movie or or say what's going to happen. Or there's some sort of so, uh, irony or, or conflict in what he's saying that tells the entire story. We just get to watch the debate of that conversation playing out. I think that scene that you're talking about, that's exactly that for this movie. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, I don't know. The other thing I'll say too is it's only like an hour and 18 minutes, but like yeah. it it feels, it's crazy because it's a movie that feels small, but feels big at the same time. Like small set, big idea. And like I said, it it, it almost, it almost gave me like a 12 Angry Men kind of vibe because like you're okay. just you're yeah. in you're in this room like you like they, they've got to work through something whether they like it or not and it's like you're yeah, there, there. It, yeah, it's almost it's like, like a it's a voyeuristic thing where you're like oh, yeah, fuck, yeah i'm a fly on the wall <laughs> yeah and it's it's a little bit of like the anti-pitch of the movie because you you know you go oh it's a you know three high school friends reunite in vegas for a bachelor party and uh but you don't <laughs> you don't ever see the the vegas stuff and right. you know that's very intentional not only because of budget because that's not what we're talking about we've seen that and yeah it's exciting to see and it's fun and there's there's still great scenes yet to be written in uh, vegas with that storyline but this wasn't about that we we know what they were going out to do or not do uh, and we know why they were all there and and we're going to debate that throughout the film but the important part wasn't seeing them at the craps table or seeing them get too drunk. Uh, we kind of all know that scene. Right. If you've seen swingers, like you've seen. Yeah. And that was, I seen, can't tell you how many times I watched swingers while I was riding it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, the, the other thing, because I, I still, I still have some things I want to talk to you about the casting, but while we're on it, the other thing that I thought was really smart about it or <clears throat> like, Slick or and I, I think a lot of horror films do this, and I think a lot of really good dramas do this. There are characters in the film that are never introduced. You you hear about them, you hear bits and pieces, and I think it does a really good job. Like I found myself wondering while I was watching the film, like what is Shane and his fiance's relationship like? Yeah. Or what is Marty and Hope's 
relationship yeah. like and i think that that coin kind of has uh, two sides to it because you you're kind of building you know as a writer you're kind of building anticipation when you keep hearing about like you know and to picture a, a revenge movie or something like oh you don't want to mess with that guy you don't okay we've been hearing about this badass all movie show him to me so you're you're kind of building this anticipation where you're like all right all right tension tension i can't wait to see him that's why i'm watching the movie and these characters aren't necessarily that but you're going oh i keep hearing about these people am i going to meet them but but the other side of that is you already know them your imagination can fill fill in the blank you know who is that in in your life what buddy of yours ha has that relationship and you can picture that girl you can picture uh you know, somebody you care about whose uh, fiance goes out of town for business and you don't exactly trust him fully or that guy who is, you would never, he won't even go to the strip club in Vegas because even if his girlfriend lets him because no, 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 he wouldn't want to do that to her. Right. You know, we can kind of just fill in those gaps and, and I feel like, I hope that a lot of people were able to do that and kind of connect it to their own a group of of friends well it it reminded me you know thinking back on it it reminded me of you know a lot of horror films do that where like right before it would show you something like like you know someone's getting run over by a wood chipper and right before yeah. the wood chipper hits it cuts to like somebody's face so you can't see but your yeah. brain is like i'm filling in oh yeah, i can yeah. only imagine like how like fucking painful and gory that would be and i feel like your film does a really good job doing that with relationships to be like, hmm, yeah. you know, I can only imagine like, you know, what the dynamic of, of Marty, you know, from the little pieces that you learn, like, you know, Oh, to be in Marty's shoes and, and to see what he would be struggling with or, you know, to, to, you know, be Shane's fiance and wondering, you know, what's happening in yeah. Vegas. And I don't yeah. know. I, it's, it was, it was very clever. Cause you know, it's, I think yeah. nowadays it's so easy to be like, Oh, let me pull her up on FaceTime or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's, there's a scene that I, I always think played a little better in the script than it did in the edit. And that's probably my fault for fucking up the, the cut. But there's a scene where Marty, when the stripper, he's so excited, where's the stripper, where's the stripper? She's going to be here soon. She's going to be here. And she finally gets there and he's so excited. He, he, while she's dancing, he's got to call his wife to tell her. <laughs> and that, it's like, Marty. Dude, I'm gonna tell you that reminded me like, of me. She's here. That reminded me <laughs> of me so hard. Where I'd be like, <laughs> "Yeah, no, she's here. She's, she's super hot. You would love oh, her." She's you know so hot. I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I was I was dying, and and my wife had gone to sleep, so I was watching it by myself, and I was like, "Oh, I wish she was up because this is." That's she would so both funny. be like, "Oh, that's you and me for sure." Yeah, um, but yeah, it's like it's like I know that guy. I know that guy. Oh yeah, it was. It, I don't know, man. It was so. It's it's. I feel like it's hard to capture. I, th I feel like it's hard to capture people being genuine, and like it's yeah. always you know, it's if you're not good at it, it's always like a okay, like they're they're playing this way, but it doesn't come across. And I, yeah. I feel like especially with Gavin, uh, which is you know your character in the film, I think. Yeah that comes across very like, like from the beginning of the film, like when you get out of the car, when you're pulling into Vegas and there's that, there's that sign, it's all decrepit and it says start a new life in Vegas. And you're looking at it and you're just like, Oh, fuck. <laughs> what like, am I doing here? You're like, you're calling, you're calling your girlfriend for emotional support. You're like, I gotta, yeah, I gotta I can't tell her where I'm going. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is another God damn. I don't want to ruin it. I'm going to, I'll, I'll tell you after <laughs> cause I want people to watch it, but some other questions I had about the casting. So, I mean, we've got Gino Caffarelli, we've got uh, Catherine Narducci. I mean, both of these, uh, both of them were in the Irishman, yeah. um, yeah. you know, so they're Scorsese, Catherine Narducci, a Bronx She's tale, everything. Dude, yeah. A, a Bronx tale is one of my, like one of my favorite movies of all time. It's so, yeah. it's so good. So what was that? Like, what was that? Like, did you just put out some feelers and be like, Hey, well, it, it was kind of built into to the producing uh, because, you know, you, you, you go into these pitches with like, okay, first of all, independent movies don't make money. So want to give me your money? 
So, you know, with that said, you still got to have some sort of a plan, you know, and, and on any scale of a film, unless the studio doesn't give a shit if your movie makes money because you are Scorsese, uh, you got to at least <laughs> look like you can make some money on your movie. And I was just so lucky, you know, being, being in LA for as many years as I have, I have a, a, a couple friends and they have some friends. So I was really lucky with uh, Gino and Kat because the guy who plays Marty, uh, Paul Gennaro, he was just a good friend of mine. He was a gym buddy, another actor who's, he's, he's been at it for a really long time, really talented guy, as you saw in the movie. And uh, he's just close friends with Gino and they work on stuff together all the time. Cat uh, is like a, a family friend to him. And it was like, you, know, you send him the script and, of course, they have to like the material, but it's like everybody's just kind of doing a favor at this point. Um, and that don't favors only go so far, but we got really lucky with just having the right connections to get people on board. That's awesome, man. And, and you know, one thing I will say, um, uh, one thing I'll say about uh, Paul was that like, again, I hate, I hate to kind of like liken it back again to Kevin Smith, but I've really got a feeling like if he was in like clerks i'd be like oh like this fucking like makes perfect sense like he's just that kind of like the way that he tells he reminded me of randall like telling the stories throughout the movie yeah yeah, yeah. and then shane is what drew kenny who i'm sure a lot of people probably recognize (laughs) him from the bachelor so (laughs) like how did is that just another like guy that you made friends with because he i mean he's awesome in the movie and i'm sure it's great well, first of all, uh, to give credit where credit's due with, with Paul, you're right. He's absolutely hysterical. And we, him and I, he's, a, he's a, the co-producer of the film. Him and I were the ones that, that put the thing together. And oh, I knew he was going to play Marty. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat at his kitchen table and had dinner with him and his mom. And he's just got me in tears laughing because he can just shit talk you to tears. <laughs> And so when I'm writing this, I know what he can do if I just throw him, throw him some lines, throw him a good monologue. And he had us, I mean, there's a scene in the movie where he with the poster. So that, that is entirely owed to the director, uh, Ryan. He, he uh, actually is a key art designer for films. He, he designs posters. So what he did, he goes, okay, your character is a TV star. I'm going to make a poster of the show he was in and, and Marty is your biggest fan. He wants you to sign it. So that scene wasn't actually written. I didn't write that scene. Ryan showed up on set with the poster. He didn't show it to anybody where he says, all right, we set the, we do the blocking and do the lighting. He goes, all right, I want you guys to just improv, talk about this, talk about that. And that's when we were on our phones. Where's the stripper? Come on, come on. So we did two takes of improv where, and he walks out, he comes back with the poster and he shows it to me. And we just, he starts riffing and in the movie, I'm in tears laughing. Not it, because that that was the scene and I had to laugh so hard, but no, I'm just fucking laughing because he's so funny. Well, that's the thing too about that scene. And that's one of those ones that I like, like I wish everybody is, that is listening had seen it so I could talk <laughs> about it a little bit more. But like, knowing you too because again like you're the entire time that i've known you've always been a very like stoic human being but there have been times where i've seen you you know like something is like cracked you up or you know you're hanging out with the right people and i was like oh like i was like not to not to call you out of like the hollywood name but i was like that's that's jamie that's jamie that's okay there you go that's it is jamie what it was like legitimately thinking something's hilarious and then that whole that whole riff Again, I won't give it away where where he's breaking down what he thinks social media messaging is. <laughs> just I was I was like, that's so like so Again, fucking that, funny. It, that we did two takes and just riffed. And and when I was editing it, I'm like, there is so much gold here as far as the humor and authenticity of this scene goes. And it's like I got nothing to cut to <laughs> because we this is just three dudes hanging out. And so you can kind of get that feel that, you know, when watching the scene that it's lacking a lot of coverage, but it, it goes back to that thing of 
you know, me being in Vegas with my buddies and they all, they all know, like you get me, a couple of my buddies can get me laughing. I cry. I cry every time I go to Vegas with them because I get laughing so hard. And, you know, we've pro I've probably said it blatantly to them of like, this is something that you can't replicate. You can't write this. You can't put this in a movie. And there's a reason you don't see this kind of uh, male friendship in a movie because you can't fake it. It has to be real. And I feel like that was what we got so lucky to have captured in that scene was that authenticity of just being so stupid and all just being in on the joke and, and, and having fun. Well, and I think the film does a really good job too. And, and especially in that scene where th there's tonal shifts in the right place. And again, without giving too much away, it really is like you're going and, I, and again, I hate to kind of like liken it to a horror film, but like that's one of my favorite things about horror films is just when you think like, okay, this is where the scare should be and it builds you up and you're like, I'm safe. And then it happens, yeah. right? When you're like, oh, okay, obviously they're not doing it. I'm unprepared. And then boom. And I think your film does the same thing where it's like, you're building, you're building, you're building, you're building, something's going to happen, cools out. And then it, it, and then it, then it kind of, opens up the way so that it can, it can get you a little bit more naturally later on. And, and right. I'll be honest, I read a review that was like, you know, the, the, the tone kind of goes up and down, but it doesn't really pay. And I'm like, no, that is the payoff. That's yeah. the payoff of the film is that and, like, yeah. And that's one of those things that not everybody is going to be on board for. And it was something that, and I've talked to the, the, the director about that specific review. And it was like, that's what we were going for. That's what we wanted because that's, you know, I, I think there's, for me, there's that goal of like, you're not necessarily, I'm not trying to write a slice of life movie, right? I want something more interesting than my fucking life. You know, there's right. got to be, I want there to be, you know, conflict. I want there to be this, there to be that. But it still has to pass as real life. You know, the objective isn't to replicate, it's to pass as real life and then be more interesting. And so I feel like with that, you know, authentic emotion of like, it, it may take a turn, but that may not be where it goes in, in, in most movies, but that's authentic. And that's how somebody would react. Yeah. And it's, uh, the other thing I was thinking too, I was like, this is, this is like the hangover. If the hangover was like a, <laughs> like a, like a, a one room drama if someone said hey i want to right. take this like because it's the same kind of thing like they're hashing out all this like old shit and and, and yeah. trying to deal with things except you know you're not waking up with in the bathroom with a tiger or something like that. Yeah, you know yeah. what i mean like yeah i think i think and i mean this is i was like ah go fuck yourself bullshit but i think a couple of reviewers it was one of them said uh it's like the hangover meets uh, uh sam shepherd play and i was like okay i'll, <laughs> I'll take, take it. that <laughs> yeah but it's like nobody could not mention the hangover because you go oh bachelor party in vegas with your friend oh hangover it's like, yeah well it's not that there's a couple scenes but it's a little different yeah and i and I, there's that there's that at least there's that other it's like a real i've seen it on hbo there's like bachelor party vegas or something like that and oh, it's like a, i think i've seen a few yeah, scenes it's, of that it's a like super it's bad so I don't know. I I would take. I think the Hangover versus like <laughs> no. Bachelor. I love no. love the Hangover. It's great. I I would aspire to be able to write that kind of humor. I just uh, well, but that's we kind of we kind of skipped all those scenes that the Hangover got so correct. Well, and that but that's the thing that I I liked about it though was that like like because again you know like the Hangover is. You know, it's a, a crazy, like, stupid buddy comedy, but, like, they have issues within the group. Yeah. And it's just, like, let's tackle those Let's tackle those issues in this big, like, crazy, ridiculous, you know, naked Asian dude popping out of a trunk and shit like that. Yeah. Where I think it's almost braver to do it in the way that you did it, where it's like, yeah, we're going to Vegas, but, like, we're going to tackle these issues head on. We, we're not yeah. going to, like... Let's not try to, and there's jokes in the movie and it's got its moments of like levity and, and lightness, but you know, it's also got its moments of like, it, dude, there's parts of this movie that are fucking dark. So like, yeah. it, <laughs> it does a really good job of, of balancing it, but it hits it more head on and saying like, 
you know, hey, we can we can just tackle these issues without having to yeah. do like this. Like, we're out in Vegas, you know. Yeah, and try you know you try to do it in in a, an authentic and honest way, especially when you're touching on addiction, because the last thing that I wanted to do was was try and tackle a theme and and do a disservice to people who struggle with that. And so it was really really important to me um, to to talk to people and make sure that I, I wasn't speaking on something that I didn't understand, and and it touches on it. Yeah, it's not, it's not a requiem for a dream where it's going there with the addiction. I think it's something that you, you're going to wake up the next morning and still have to fight that addiction. And you're going to get through that day and you're, you're going to wake up again and you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror. And you're going to have to do it again. And you may not necessarily get the feeling like, oh, he's, he might go off the wagon. He's going to die. That's where we're going. It's like, no, he might go off the wagon. And then he has to fucking battle this thing again and again and again and again. And no matter how much you believe that you're out or you've escaped it and whatever your advice may be, whether, and I think this is what I was trying to, a big part of what I was trying to say with the movie, whether, you know, your vice is, is, is women or, or drugs or booze or, or cheating or all of them. Hey, or no, all just, of them. Just, yeah. you just, still, just you, kidding. no matter how many days you got, you still got to get the next one. And, and I think that's a really, really hard thing to live with. And, and I think that's why I wanted to talk about it. And definitely from a personal place, but also, you know, the initial title, when I first started writing it, working title was called Chaser because it's like, you're just, you're just trading in, you're trading in addictions. He traded the, my character, Gavin, he traded in his, uh, his, need for for validation in through his career he got to the top there was no more oh didn't do the trick didn't fix me it's, it's like you're not going to love yourself you, you can't love anybody else till you love yourself and he's chasing this validation gets to the top okay what now drugs okay bottom out with that what now Ooh, here's a girl that's my new addiction and it's like and he says at one point in the movie, he says, just swaps. It's just swaps. You're going, you think you think you got a hold of it, but really you've just traded it out for something else. And I feel like it was important for me, especially in my life, to take a close look at what my addictions are, whether it be, you know, something big and life threatening or something that's like, yo, man, this it's fine. You'll probably live to see another day, but you're not gonna be who you wanna be. And then the the actual struggle to change that, to change who you are, to change the the algorithm that makes up how you're going to respond to something. And it is, you know, one day at a time, one action at a time. I do this thing here. It changes who I am just a little bit. And I do, if I do enough of those little things, I may be a little closer to who I want to be. Yeah. And. I will say one thing I really respected about it, uh, about the film is the fact that it is a very honest portrayal of addiction where, you know, you see so many movies where it's like, yeah, I did like a bump of Coke one time. And then, you know, it's like, it almost like, like it's a mo like there's movies out there about addiction that almost, like hyper fetishize or like glorify it, even though it's yeah. trying to be like, you know, look how bad this is. Uh, yeah. And not that like, you know, some, some people who have had that haven't had like a hell of a, like hell of a fun time. Right. But, you know, one, and again, without kind of giving it away, but like your, you, t your character talks about how he got started down that road during the film. And it's, it's a very, it's very grounded in, reality as opposed to being like well i was on set and yeah. sylvester stallone like, was like no. you want to do this blow you know <laughs> like, that's not i mean maybe for some people that's not how it happens you know no. oh uh, i just this thing happened and yeah i i, I took a painkiller oh that made that helped that helped yeah. i, think I feel helped. great oh, that helped Ooh, i felt good i'm gonna yeah. just zonk out and watch a movie right let me and take six like, yeah. And then it's like, no matter how much you get away from it, you're just looking for an excuse to do it again. And it's like you, 
something bad happens, something bad happens. And it's like, oh, I, uh, I'm going to do it because this happened. You're just waiting for the right reason. And you may get strong enough that like, I didn't do it because I had a bad day. I didn't do it because, oh, I hurt my leg. I didn't do it because of this. And, and hey, I'm pretty strong. And then something actually happens that throws you for a loop. And you're like, oh, yep, I'm fucking going for it. Yeah. Or, you know, I think another thing too is because like, and again, I think that's something you do really do really well in the film is like, there are moments when you're like, oh yeah, like he's got this. And then, then it's like, oh, you think you've got it. And then fucking plane crash. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I think, and it's, it's, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was just going to say, and it's like, yeah, that may be what happens in the film. Maybe for some people could be a really fucking upsetting thing. And you may want to fucking snap but i think you see pretty quickly like once he's experiencing that feeling he's like "Ooh, i got a good enough reason right yeah and i think sometimes like you know just in people that i i know in 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 life and and experiences like luckily that's never anything that i've had to like battle my own but yeah you know, I think you're right. You know, you take it, things happen where you take it like, you know, I had, I had my daughter and I was like, man, am I like, is there anything like I need to cut out? You know what I mean? Cause like yeah. you, you know me from a long time ago. Like I was a little fucking Cheech and Chong back in the day. And yeah. now it's, you know, now it's like, you know, fuck if anything ever happened, I've got this kid and like, you yeah. know, you like, like, you're like, oh, well, that just doesn't fit into my life anymore, you know? And yeah, it's, it's like the same thing on the other hand of like, you know, uh, if you got a, a good enough reason to go back to using, you know, sometimes you might just bump into a circumstance in life that is a good enough reason to stop you. Yeah, well, using. I have a friend who got clean and it was very like, just started getting text messages. Hey man, heard you got out of rehab great for you dude hey by the way i've got this for you know ten dollars a pill Aye. it's like it's like well uh, uh, bro like focus on the first part of that text message and i think right. some of it too is like sometimes like you said like oh i didn't have it when i when i hurt my leg or i didn't have it when i got stressed out i'm in control of this i can have it just for fun you know what i mean so yeah. i think yeah there's that too yeah there, there's a lot of movies out there that tackle it but i feel like you guys did a really good job of keeping it grounded in, in reality. And I think that people who have struggled with it personally or people who have loved ones or friends that have, have struggled with it, I think when they watch it, it's going to resonate in a way that yeah. like Requiem for a Dream doesn't. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, because it's, you know, it's, it's high stakes, but also it's not so high that it's in, in movie world. And of, and of course, you know, people have issues to that extent, yes. But also there's people that, that struggle that don't have it to that extent. And, and I feel like, um, you know, you get to see it with my character just what a beast the, the demon in him is. And just once what he's willing to throw away. And it's like from this great uh, reunion with his friends to like, fuck everything in life mm -hmm. because i get to do my drug again yeah well and i think you do a really good job of showing that duality too because like there was one point in the movie i was like bro is james he's trying to be batman he threw on a straight <laughs> he threw on a straight fucking batman voice but but in the but it, it's, yeah, it's it dropped down a little bit when i get angry yeah but it's 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 showing that like flip of a switch. And like, if yeah. I have the, if I have the excuse to yeah. let this out, then it's like, that's what I've been yeah. waiting for. It's like this soft spoken guy of, of like, uh, I'm here to see you guys. Uh, I'm sorry for everything. You know, I appreciate you guys being there. Like, don't get in the fucking way right. of what I'm about to do. Cause you don't want to see what's going to happen. Right. And it's, it's just, like, that's that switch. Well, and I think it, it represents almost like the, like the real life, like Jekyll and Hyde, you know what I mean? Where it's yeah, like, big time. Like I've got this thing inside and I think everybody does, you know, like I'm, I'm a pretty jolly, you know, I'm, I'm chubby, jolly dude, but down there somewhere is like, yeah. get the fuck away from me. You know and, I mean? and that, that's why that, that story is, is so universal and, and lasting because like you said, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, any wolf movie, 
essentially. That, that's the theme you're touching on, you know, the picture of Dorian Gray, all of these long lasting pieces of work that so many people resonate with because I think it's a, it's a part of uh, our nature. I'll tell you what, man. Um, I just, I really, really, really enjoyed it. And I'm hoping that, uh, part of me, again, part of me hopes that nobody sees it. So that, <laughs> that Joe and Eddie and Dan, none of them oh, get their, yeah. their money back. But at the same time, I want everybody to see it so that well, you Joe, are I'm not successful. Giving, I'm not giving Joe a dime, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, well, we made 10 million, buddy. So well, here's the nothing. thing. I could show up with, uh, hey, we made all this money. He, he'd go, I'm not taking a fucking dime. <laughs> yeah. That's, I that's gave, the kind of guy I gave he is. You that, I gave you that money to help. Joe is, is the nicest guy in the world out of spite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a compliment. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's a member of the New Dad Club too. So shout out to, yeah. uh, to Joe. Hope you're getting sleep, man. Because I know I didn't for a really long yeah. time. So. But mean, uh, he's... he's completely cut out to be a great dad though so yeah man he's a he's a i think he'll be all right he's a quality dude man uh he'll always be my subway number one so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh well i wanted to ask you so well real quick before i forget yeah I for sure i have like this this already horrible guilt about you asking about drew and me saying ah, let me talk about somebody else no for but sure back to what you, you asked about drew and and uh I, I met him in an acting class and I had seen him perform uh, a scene from a play called uh, Tape. It's a really, really great play. And it was actually made into to a film with Ethan Hawke. Very low budget. It's the same kind of thing. It's like, I think they shot it for a uh, hundred thousand and it was in one hotel room. And it wasn't like the, the, I've seen the it. Suite it's the, the two bo- friends, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. That movie is fucking And it gets awesome. real fucking dark. Yes. It's so, so good. Uh, that one of the characters is, you know, he's kind of the, the uptight guy. He's a filmmaker. He's, he's in town for the whatever national, uh, 10th an- annual East Lansing film festival. And he yeah, cause it takes place in Michigan there. too, doesn't it? And so I'm watching Drew do this thing and, and he's very, very calm. And, and all of a sudden it takes a turn and it's like, Oh, and I'm, I'm halfway through the script and I go, Oh, that's Shane. And, and I talked to him about it and we, you know, we read through some things and he's, he's one of my best friends now. Uh, you know, the play we were talking about earlier on an average day, he, he got a hold of that, asked me if I wanted to, you know, throw something up just in, in front of, um, a class and we did a scene and he's like, would you, would you be down to star in this thing? Yeah. So he put it all together. He produced the whole thing and we did, uh, I blocked big portion of that part of my life but i think it was a nine week run in hollywood uh we did uh, uh three three uh nights a week and it was uh, I'm forever grateful to him because it was probably the the greatest challenge i've ever had as an actor well that's awesome too and i think to i mean not to like <laughs> not to like belittle it or anything like that but i think a lot of people, when you when you think of some of show like The Bachelor or something like that, it seems like people who participate in it, it may be you know may not have the most depth. So I and I'll be honest, I saw I saw the movie before I knew, and I was like, I like I fucking love this dude. And then when yeah. you know, I started looking because I I knew <laughs> like you know I knew I I knew you know obviously. Uh, uh, Catherine Narducci, like I knew these people, but then I was like, like that dude looks really familiar. Let me look and see what else he's been in. And I was like, Oh, like that's, so so it's, it's cool to, to be like, Oh yeah. Like you can do something like that, but you can also. And and, and he's worked really hard to really, you know, it's almost like you think that that's a leg up, but from knowing him and seeing, you know, his, his career, it's like, he's had to work twice as hard just to escape that, uh, idea of him. And it's so funny because it, at the time when I met him, uh, and my girlfriend at the time, who you know, Chelsea, she was mm-hmm. like, Oh my God, you know, Drew. And I was like, <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and she was, He was on The Bachelor. And I go, Okay. Or The Bachelorette. It was The Bachelorette. But 
he's yeah not i'm that, sorry the bachelor right. it'd be weird if he was on the bachelor my bad right right <laughs> and you know he's he's got his 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 own stories about that that part of his life but i, I give the guy all the credit in the world because he's really stuck it out and busted his ass to 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 not be that guy that and it's not fair but that guy that you think of when you think of the bachelorette and and he is an actor and a professional the definition of he's going to work harder than anybody in the room on his craft on his character he's going to know more about the script than than me when i wrote the fucking thing he's going what, what, what did, did we play sports when we were young our characters we would probably would have played hockey and i go well, yeah we would have played hockey right. <laughs> and i'm writing this shit down and it's like that's the guy that he is well and part of me too thinks that like th- i'm ex- i'm i'm excited to see what all three of you do um moving forward and what what other opportunities they are what the next project looks like but for someone like drew i think it's it's you know there's so many stories of people who were pigeonholed from the beginning and then they they kind of show out and they're like you know have this crazy crazy talent and they end up doing all these you know amazing like i think of somebody like heath ledger you know what i mean who is like you're in 10 things i hate about you and you're this heart throbbing before yeah. you punch your ticket, like you're you're playing one of the darkest, you know, yeah. darkest we'll, characters that modern cinema has we'll, probably we'll seen. We'll be that guy. And, and that's what the play was for him. And I think, I, I, you know, now I'm speaking for him, but I think that was a big reason why he wanted to to do that play other than resonating with the material so much. But it was like a lot of, you know, mutual friends, people we know, industry uh, associates came to see the play. And it was like, you picture Shane from two ways now his hair is a mess and greasy and down to his shoulders. His uh, cheeks are sunken in. He's lost 25 pounds for the role. And he, you're going, what the fuck? He's going okay, full Christian Drew. Bale. <laughs> <laughs> and you watch him. For, he had people in, in tears in the audience. And it was, it was, I was so happy to see him be able to prove that. That's awesome, man. And, and yeah, I will say, I think, he was so not that I imagine this is the kind of person that he is, but something about him in the role of Shane was so believable where yeah. you're kind of like, I will, I wouldn't be surprised if you're a little <laughs> if you're not, you know, now obviously yeah. don't think that he is, but like there's people yeah. who portray a role that you're like, yeah. Oh, you're, you're probably just fucking slamming chicks like you know oh, yeah. I mean? and it's like, like you know you're trying to talk about it in and not so cliche way because you're like this character i think he curses once in the entire movie when he finally snaps at the end you're like this guy button up lawyer perfect jawline to the nicest sweetest guy just wants everything to go well oh he uh, in some people's opinion, maybe the biggest fucking prick of us all. And then Marty, who's a fucking this, fucking that, the construction worker who's telling the story about being at the strip club and, and doing this and that, he would never hurt a fly. Yeah. And I think that that's the juxtaposition. And, and I think we all know those guys. Well, it, it somewhat reminded me of American Psycho. Where it's like <laughs> he'd be the guy that like you'd be fuming for days if your business card was nicer than it. you know what I mean like and yeah. I think that's what you say it's like almost like uh, you know some of the some of the scariest people and some of the biggest villains at least in real life are people that you would never expect it's the button up yeah. it's the you know what I mean like and and in his case he didn't know he doesn't you don't know you're the villain. You don't know you're the bad guy. You think you're the hero of your story. You know, there's been times in my life where I'm going, no, 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 but you don't, but you don't. Oh, fuck. I'm the asshole here, aren't I? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you don't know it. And it takes so much introspection to be able to go, oh, I need to change. And I think that's what's so powerful about Shane's character is he's, he's uh, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, I don't want to be this guy. I thought I was going to be, I thought I was going to be you. You're, you're, you're supposed to act this way. I, I wanted to be the good guy. And I think that. And that guy me, sucks. That, that, that guy fucking sucks. 
I think for me, that was the purpose of, of what I wanted to say with that character. I, I think, I think you did a really good job, man, because it's, it's, it, and again, I'm really trying the, the only criticism I have of the entire film is there is a shot that where you guys are eating French toast. That is entirely too long. It was uncomfortable. <laughs> it was uncomfortable watching you eat French toast like, that long. My favorite shot. <laughs> <laughs> but it yeah, really, but you're like, yeah, that's good. It lingers. Yeah. But well, listen, I, you know, there, there's plenty to criticize about the movie if it's not your thing. And I get that. And I know that it's, it's not for everybody, but I do think that, you know, if anything we've talked about, uh, resonates with anybody who, who's listening then then it it may make you think about something or make you feel something well and i think though too that there's also something about a film that's not for everyone because if you're one of those people who watch it and it is for you you're like oh i'm in this club like yeah like you know i i don't know man like i think like i said if you're if you're if the primary if you you know the primary thing that you're into is like you know, die hard and you're really pumped for like fast and furious 14. And that's like what you normally like the Avenue that you watch this movie may not be the yeah. cup of tea for you, but if yeah. you like things that make you think, cause that's, that's really what I, what I took away from is watching it was a lot of like, not only thinking about the characters, but kind of thinking almost of like, which one of these guys am I, or which one of these guys am I closest yeah. to? And okay. what I think you, you did a really good job of is being like, am I this guy? But I think, you know, am I ashamed? But I think I'm a Martin, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, I think it's, you kind of go, Oh shit. I'm a little bit of all of them. And it's not always the most satisfying answer, but you know, like we talked about when all, all the guys read the script and it was like, Oh, it's, this guy is, is Joe or this guy is that guy. It was like, you know, it definitely stole some things from, you know, the people that I know in life. It, but it was kind of like, well, they're kind of all different versions of me. You know, and like you said, and also in, in some respects, the person I want to be, the person uh, I'm afraid to be, and the person that I probably am. And, and none of that is very comfortable. Right. Well, it, you know, there's something about something that makes, there's something about a piece of, art whether it's a song or a painting or a film or you know whatever it is there's something about a piece of of art like that or a piece of content that can that makes you take a look at yourself that i think resonates with you in a way that yeah. you know a cookie cutter like pop song or you know again yeah. your michael bay it just it doesn't hit the same way and, and i and in that respect i think it's like, I think it's okay if it doesn't resonate with anybody because, or if not, if it doesn't resonate with some people, because yeah. for the people that it does, it's, it's that much more of a, of a, of a connection to it. I think the other thing that I, yeah. I'm excited for is I really do believe that because of this, I mean, you've shown that like, Hey, I can put together a project completely on my own. I can write it. I can produce it. I can star in it. I can cast the people that I want to have in it. So I think this is going to be a case where down the line, you're going to have, you're going to have uh, this. I, I feel like this is going to be a stepping stone to a much larger career for yeah. you. And I think people are going to be like, 30. have you seen two ways to go west? Like that's the first <laughs> movie, dude. It's so fucking good. Like I'll people don't to, get I'll it, but to, it's so fucking to, good. If I ever get to that point, I'll have to take it down. <laughs> no. But uh, it, something you said that I think you nailed it. it. It's for me, you know, books I read, movies I like, things that make me think and, and, and that I resonate with are things that hold up a mirror. And you don't know it. You don't realize it when you're watching or reading the thing. And you can essentially look at this character completely objectively because it's not you. And then by the end of it, you go, oh, that is me and you're looking right in the mirror and now you have an honest a little bit more of an honest opinion of yourself and and you know it, you, as a writer i can't really escape that theme because it it tends to find its way into everything that i write is you know holding up a mirror to the reader and and the way to do that is hold up a mirror to myself well i think that's how you 
I really think that's the best way to, to reach people is to say like, Hey man, this is me. And I'm going to pour me into what I do. Yeah. And the, and the best, it's like, if you come at someone and you're like, you know, you got a fucking problem. All right. You need to cut this shit out. You go, fuck you. Yeah. If it's like, Hey man, you know, uh, I I'm struggling with this thing. Can we talk about it? Then they're much more likely to be like, you know what? I kind of feel the same way. Uh, I, I'm an asshole too, <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> whatever it may be. But I think that that's effectively the purpose of art for me is, is to try and reach people and give them a fair or different perspective on, on some theme or, or topic. Well, I got to tell you, man, I'm just like, like I told you in the beginning of the show and, and I, I so genuinely mean it that I'm just so proud of you for someone that is like, you know, like I said, man, this is a dream you've been chasing. And then, you know, to, to trust me, if anybody knows what it's like to be like, yeah. Hey man, I'm just going to pack up everything I own and just fucking <laughs> see what happens, you know, yeah. like hours from home, you know, it's, it's, uh, you gotta be a bit delusional. You do. And I, well, and, and I think you also have to, I think there has to be like an element of adventure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like, you know, like it was crazy because when I moved down here, you know, me and my wife were just dating and I was like, yeah, you know, well, if anything, ha and I've told her this before, but it's like, well, you know, yeah. if anything happens, like I can always move home. You know That's what I mean? Thing. You, can always, you can always go back. But now it's, and I'm wondering if it's the same way with your career, but now it's like, you know, I've got like a home and I've got a job yeah. and I've got my dog. So it's like, if anything were heaven for it ever to happen, like, this is home now. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and there's, and, and I'm sure you can attest to this, but there's a point where, and it's a gradual shift, but there's a point where you're like, this is home now. And, and it can be hard. It can be uncomfortable and you can resist it a lot because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's completely different tribe. And, and regardless of, of how you may feel about the world or your traditions or your culture, you're going to be affected by the people that surround you, the point of view of, of uh, the world that you live in. And it can be really uncomfortable, I think. But also at the same time, you know, that's, I think that's one way to grow. And, and for me, it's always like, I always in my own small ways, like the rebel of like, I'm never, if someone tells me to do something, I'm going to do the opposite. Right, And it's like, of course, that that's just another way of controlling somebody because you, you know, how predictable is that? They're going to fucking rebel. But right. for me, it's like, you know, you, you say no to everything. Say no. Why would I believe that? Why? No, 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 no. And then you go through a phase of life where you're kind of cynical and you like, fuck that. I don't believe in that. How could you think that? And then I, I hope this is where you get to, but you get to a phase of where you start to say yes again. And it may be to those exact things that you were saying no to in the first place, but now you've decided because you learned it on your own. And I feel like you may find some of those same values, ethics, traditions, uh, points of view that you were told to have, but you could have never really believed it. You would have just been fake, faking it until you, you figure it out on your own. And I think that that is, is one thing that the adventure has taught me. Yeah, man. And, and I think you're right too. I mean, it's like, you know, I know moving from Michigan down to the South, I mean, like there's just in the way people talk and the way, you know, a lot of yeah. the views and stuff are different where, you know, I t like me and my wife were super liberal, but I tell her all the time, I was like, you know, California would probably be the best place for us to live. But, you know, I'm, I'm chubby in Tennessee and <laughs> in Los Angeles, I'd be morbidly obese. Like kids would be throwing stuff at me. Like, so Maybe it's throw, throwing kombucha at all of us. Right. <laughs> Antioxidants, antioxidants. Yep. <laughs> but you know, so, but I think you're right. It's like, it's, it's at what point, uh, at what point are you a transplant to like, I've been planted? You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it's and weird. you don't realize it you don't realize it until after the fact. And, you know, as much as I love going home and seeing everybody, that's, I mean, at this point, that's the only thing I go for mm -hmm. is to see the people that I care about. And when I get there, it's only a matter of time before I'm like, I want to, I got to get back home and not because, Oh, this place is better. This place. No, it's, it's, this is where 
your this responsibilities. My, my and... goals are my responsibilities, my my routines, uh, my objectives, the things that that you know release that dopamine because I did this thing that I'm so want to be doing every day because it brings me a little closer to who I want to be as a person. And then when you know you leave, whether it's home or anywhere else in the world, I feel like you are at risk of kind of reverting maybe back to some of those things that create the person you don't necessarily want to be. Yeah. I think it's also good, you know, like for people listening who maybe wanted to take the chance or, you know, try something like, you know, after I quit working at the pizza place, I was working in a factory, you know what I mean? And if I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have met my wife and then been like, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to take my chance on this adventure and, and oh, this yeah. relationship feels right. Like I wouldn't have the family that I have. I wouldn't have the, you know, so it's like all the good things that I have now and things that I wouldn't give up for the world yeah. have come from that one decision. So, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing for, you know, like, Hey, take, and take the chance. For me, it's, it's, I don't think there's a wrong answer. I just think that there's a, you know, a wrong reason. You know, and if you're being honest with yourself and not that that's easy to do or that I'm even capable of doing it, but I feel like if you're being honest with yourself, whether you stay or whether you go, it was the right choice. And and I don't think that, you know, one lifestyle or, or, or one uh, path makes a goddamn difference. If If you're going to find a way to be a happy person, you can do that anywhere in the world, doing anything in the world. You know, I can, I could you know, relating it back to the movie, you could become a, a famous actor. That's amazing, right? You could be fucking miserable. And I mean, we all know that story. Or you could, you know, deliver pizzas as we did for so many years. You could do that for your whole life and still find joy and happiness. That was I my favorite it's, it's, job, hands down, to this day. Yeah. If I can make enough money to pay my mortgage fucking delivering pizzas, oh, yeah. I would still be doing that. Well, listen, when I drove out uh, to LA, I, again, I packed up. I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have. I didn't know anything. And again, that's that necessary delusion of like, eh, I'll figure it out. Um, but I got here and the next day I'd, I scouted for a year all the pizza places in town and all the neighborhoods and where I would make the most tips. And... Uh, I, will, I, I got here, first day here, I, I went and got a gym membership, the gym I, I scouted and wanted to work out and uh, on Sunset Boulevard because I thought that that was cool and mattered. And then uh, I put on a button-up shirt and some slacks and I walked down the street to uh, Joe's Pizza. And they hired me on the spot. I started that night. They go, come, if you can come behind the counter and make a pizza, we'll, we'll hire you. I thought I was going to be looking for a job for three, four months. And if I didn't find a job, I didn't know it at the time, but if I didn't find a job in three weeks, I would have been packing my ass up and moving home probably. Mm-hmm. I started that night. I worked there f- delivering pizzas in, in the hills to <laughs> crazy people for a year and a half. And it was like just lucked out because I walked into a pizza place because of the job I had as a, as a kid. Yeah, man, it's crazy that like if you're – if you're willing to open yourself up to the universe, you know what I mean? Like I'm not a very, I'm not a religious person. I kind of, what we're talking about before, I think a lot of, you know, people like get off drugs and then they find Jesus and that's like their new, but I am very, like if you put out good energy, I think good energy will come back to you. Yeah. And I I think at the end of the day, you know, all the, all the practical bits of wisdom, every, religion or uh, civilization or psychology or philosophy teaches it's all the same shit it's just a different way of getting there and it's like you know the same reason we quote uh, the stoics or, or marcus aurelius because it's all the same simple truths whether it comes from the bible or uh the stars yeah and i i mean i agree man i think you know it's it's it seems like you know, if you, if you're just, if you're good and genuine and you put that out, it's hard to, it's hard to think that like you wouldn't get that back. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, you know, and but, at the end of the day, you know, you, it's a selfish thing to, to, to do the right. right thing because, you know, for me, you're creating your own heaven or hell with everything you do because you're creating the, I know how this sounds, <laughs> but you're creating the person that you're going to be and you got to live with that fucker. 
And it's like, if, and I know from experience, if I act like a, a piece of shit and lie to myself about it for years, I'm going to wake up one day, not believe that lie anymore. And now I got to deal with that. I got to deal with the shame and the guilt. And now I'm living in hell. And if I can live my life doing the thing that uh, I believe to be objectively right, I'm going to wake up and, and hopefully some of that stuff's going to subside and I'm going to be able to respect who I see in the mirror every day. When I, you know, to kind of bring it full circle, man, I think that's really the message of the the film overall is like yeah. taking a good hard look at yourself and like, you know, can I live with the person that I see? And I think you do a really, really good job of, of, kind of showing that lesson and, and also kind of showing like what the consequences are if you can't, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? And, and, if, and if you can't, then I, I, I like to think that there's still hope, you know, that you don't got to double down on that and change your, your point of view to match who you've become. Yeah. It's not just like, well, fuck it. I'm a piece of shit. I'm going to stay. It. I'm going to stay. I'm going to keep, I'm going well, to keep justifying, keep making excuses. And I, I, you know, I, I've done it. I've done it. I go, well, if someone else were doing this, I'd probably judge it pretty harshly. And it's like, you know, we're objective with everybody else and we're subjective with ourselves. And I think the goal is, is the exact opposite of that. And, and it's definitely something I was trying to touch on in the film is like, you know what, cut everybody else some slack and be a little harder and more honest with yourself. Yeah, and I think you get that a lot. Again, man, I don't want to spoil anything, but I think you get that a lot in like the like the voicemail scene, which again, I don't want to, you know, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, where it's like, fuck, seven, <laughs> you know, what I mean? yeah. but, but I like, I think, I don't know, man, I think it, it, I think it's a movie that if anybody has had those lifelong, those lifelong friends, those people that like, you've had that relationship with for years and years and years and years and years, and years I think it's something that, that you'll be able to relate to. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, I found myself thinking about relationships and uh, well, that makes me happy. Well, I, and I do, I do, you know, uh, we're hitting the two hour mark here. So I, oh I will, we'll wrap up, but I did want to ask you in your opinion. So if people want to check out the movie, what is the best way? Cause I know it's on like Amazon. It's yeah. on like, yeah, what's the best way that, for you? You know, honestly, it's going to depend on, uh, their means of watching it. So you can, you know, talk into your remote or type it into your TV, two ways to go West or James Liddell. And, uh, it'll pop up on whether you're on Apple TV, it'll come up on iTunes or Amazon on Amazon prime. Uh, you can buy or rent, uh, it should be on uh, Roku devices and voodoo as well, but also it's on, uh, uh, an awesome app, which I had before, uh, the movie came out called uh two TV. And it's free. So just download the app. Uh, there's some commercials. So if you don't want to watch the commercials, then you can pony up. But it's free on Tubi. So I, w so I knew it was on Tubi. I paid. I, just, ah, I appreciate if you're it, listening, brother. <laughs> if you're listening, it's on Amazon. It's $3.99 to rent it on Amazon. It's 13 bucks if you want to buy it and watch it a bunch. So it's completely affordable. You're not going out. You're not eating dinner <laughs> places. You're not going to concerts. That. Just spend the four fucking dollars. It's good. What but, I told my parents was they bought, you know, they bought it on Amazon Prime, of course, <laughs> to support. But my, their TV is hooked up to my Amazon Prime, so I bought it for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there you go, going, mom and dad. And, and then they're going, well, we're going to watch it again. I go, wait, whoa, okay. You, we already bought it. Go on to BTV and just let it play in the background all day long. So, now, you know, the, the ad rev will we'll collect that way. Oh, for sure. Well, I, I mean, yeah. Or if, you know, if you are, I have to be as well. Um, and I saw, I look, I, you know, I did the search before I watch anything. I always like, we'll go in and just be like, you know, two ways to go West streaming. And so I can see like, yeah, which, you know, if it's on Amazon, I know I've got a Roku TV, all that stuff. And I saw it on Tubi and I was like, there's no way it's on Tubi. And I hit it. It was like free. And I was like, I'm not doing that shit. I got to, yeah. I got to, it's <laughs> not like it's like it. $15 to rent. We got to, yeah. we got to, you know, so, yeah. and also, man, I think, you know, too, coming from the, coming from the, you know, playing in bands and the independent artists and things like that, man, like, like, I don't think you, people watch a movie where they hear a song or buy an album and they don't, I think a lot of the times they don't realize how much of your, 
like yeah. time and how much of your hair has been pulled out into your fists from like I'd like yeah. trying to be like I need to get this just right. So if you are in a in a place where you can afford four dollars, yeah. Fucking, and also, just you know, <laughs> for me, it's like at the end of the day, I don't. I know what the movie is. I know what's good about it, and I know what I could critique. But also, we made a movie for nothing, right? And, and to make a movie or or an album or whatever it may be on nothing but sweat equity and a few bucks. I mean, that, that is the accomplishment in itself, you know, and I, I don't think people realize what that takes, even if you do, because it's like a million dollar movie is low budget. That's a low budget movie. Oh, for sure. So but they it's, do it for what 20% a, percent, a percentage of a low budget movie. It, it, I, I owe it all to the people involved, uh, Ryan Brookhart, uh, Paul, uh, Shane, all those guys, the DP, everyone did this out of passion. And, and that's how independent films get made. Well, the story is awesome. The movie looks beautiful from like the opening shot. I mean, just if you're someone who is, um, I've had, I have a friend on, uh, who's been on the show, uh, Matt Satterfield. He's a, uh, Emmy Award cinematographer, and so oh, I'm gonna. Cool. I'm, I was watching. I was like, I need to send this to him um, oh, yeah. so that he can watch it. And but I mean, it, it it's it's stylish. It looks good. The story is great. The music is awesome. Again, man, I'm just super super proud of you. It's so good. Um, Thanks, we sir. will we'll link up. I'll put the uh, the Amazon link. I'll put the um, the Roku link. I'll put I'll put the two B one all the way down at the bottom. But fucking <laughs> pay it for it. But. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say thank you for being here, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. you, man. This was awesome. And uh, sorry for babbling for two hours. Dude, that's but, okay. Uh, These are my no, favorite episodes, fun. man. I, I had appreciate a, it. had a great time. Well, uh, do me a favor. Will you hang, up, uh, hang out for me after we wrap up? Yep. Awesome. Guys, that is uh, episode 28 in the books. Two ways to go west. Go buy it. $3.99. You can rent it. You can buy it for $12.99. Uh, James Liddell, thank you so much for being here. And we will see you guys next week for episode 29. Later. Oh,